Mike, and what an appropriate song on Zion's glorious summon mount. We left off in Revelation 14 looking at Mount Zion, amen? amen? And we learned that Mount Zion was symbolic of all of God's people in heaven and on earth in his church. Yes. And at the end of Revelation 14, we saw the picture of Jesus reaping the harvest of all the saved disciples' world evangelism in one generation, amen? amen. And we saw also the wrath of God pictured as a man stomping on the grapes under a wine press. And then we took a couple breaks from our Revelation series because we figured there's been so much doom and gloom, we need some faith and inspiration, amen? amen. And yet now we pick back up in Revelation chapter 15, and today we're going to study Revelation chapter 15, Revelation chapter 16, Come on now. Revelation chapter 17, Woo! Revelation chapter 18, Woo! and Revelation chapter 19. Woo! Now, for all the clock watches out there, don't worry, we'll still get done at the same time. Amen. But prayerfully, you came to church to get in the Word of God. starts writing and he writes in what's called apocalyptic language these symbols to convey a message of victory and triumph during the Roman Empire's intense persecution under the Emperor Domitian and Christians were being killed for their faith and so the message of Revelation is hold on to the testimony of Jesus and don't give up amen church and certainly that's a relevant message for us today because we go through persecutions hardships and trials in our own lives and we fight against our own sin but the message is Jesus will have the victory amen. and in chapters 15 and 16 are what called the seven plagues that are poured out of seven bowls of God's divine wrath another series of seven and chapter 15 verse 8 shows us that this is actually the completion of God's wrath in rapid succession and it leads in its final bowl right before it to what's called the Battle of Armageddon. And the title of our lesson this morning is Armageddon, the Battle of Gods. God's judgment comes on those who worship the beast and we learn from our study who's the beast. Who's the beast? The dragon, Satan, who's the beast? Rome. Rome, the Roman Empire, right? Or any empire, the dragon empire that goes against God, amen? amen? And then we pick up here in chapter 16, verse 8, towards the end of the bowls of wrath. The Bible says this in chapter 16, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch the people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and maybe you feel like that at church this morning, amen? Yes. And they cursed the name of God who had control over those plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Now he's pictured these intense plagues coming on the earth at this time. And he says the stubbornness of people still won't change. Well, our hearts can be so stubborn that we still refuse the discipline of God. That's scary. Well, verse 10, it says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But they refused to repent of what they had done. Wow. Well, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Well, people still refuse to repent after the wrath of God, and now things are coming to a close, and Jesus is going to return. Amen? And Revelation uses symbolic language to convey a message. Of course, you've got the demonic spirits that look like frogs. Well, frogs remind us of what plagues in the Old Testament? Egypt. Do you remember that? 
And so, of course, all these things, again, are symbols. And sadly, what's been taken today is a lot of people have taken and tried to make Revelation this literal book and tried to go on a hunt looking for times and places that this is all going to happen. The message is simply be faithful because you don't know when the Lord's going to return. Amen? Amen. And then we need to be strong and we need to be close to our God. And all the different ways the rats are described with the sun and all these things are just simply Jewish language to convey it's going to be intense and yet people sadly will still not repent. You know, Armageddon's interesting. We find here it's not so much a literal war in one sense because we're gonna see at the end it ends very quickly with Jesus' return. The word comes from the Hebrew word meaning Tel Megiddo. And a Tel was kind of like, not quite a mountain, but like a, a, a hill, and then there was a plain. And what's significant about uh, the field of Armageddon or what was known as Megiddo in Old Testament history, it was a place of numerous decisive battles in a broad plain. For example, Deborah and Borak defeated Assyria and the Canaanite army there in Judges 4 through 5. Gideon drove out the Midianites. You remember he had the 300 and took out the 185,000 Midianites there. That was in Megiddo or Armageddon in Judges 6. Saul and the army of Israel were defeated because they failed to trust God in 1 Samuel 31 in this field. The Egyptian army under Pharaoh uh, Necho was killed, uh, uh, killed Josiah, the king of Judah, here in this field. So what's God saying? He's simply using an Old Testament name or language to describe God's going to have the victory in the end. Yeah. This is God's battle. And he says in verse 15, Jesus is coming and blessed is the one who stays awake. You awake this morning, church. Come on out. You see, Revelation shows us there's a whole spiritual battle going on around us. If God could unleft the veil this morning and we saw like the demons like all around us and we saw the angels standing there, we would be awake, would we not? Right. There you go. Oh my gosh, this is, this is intense. And God says, stay awake, be clothed with righteousness, be ready so you're not shamefully exposed when the Lord returns. And this is a message that's not preached so often today. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready for it? Come on out. You know, in chapter 16, verse 17, it says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it had ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake, the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on the people. And they cursed God on account of the plague of the hail because the plague was so terrible. If you're a first century Christian, you're reading this, you're going, justice is being served. Babylon the Great, Rome, that great beast that persecuted and killed the Christians, now falls. And it falls because it's divided into three parts. Some commentators have said these three parts are Rome was divided with, number one, the pagan people that worshipped their idols and their gods. Number two, the anti-Christian people, the one that, that persecuted the early church. And number three, of course, the Christians. Amen. And Rome is pictured here as coming to complete ruin, drinking the full wrath of God's fury. You know, we've got three points this morning. Our first point don't be seduced by the prostitutes. Mm. Chapter 17, we're going to be introduced to another figure of Rome called Babylon, the great prostitute. Let's read in verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by the many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, an abomination of the earth. I saw that woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people and the blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Now Rome's pictured as a prostitute that seduces people by all her jewelry and all that she has to offer. And it says the people of the earth are intoxicated by her. 
They're enthralled by her. They're pulled in by her, and she is drunk on the blood of all the saints that were killed for their faith. She just gets drunk on it and keeps on drinking that blood. And of course, this is the satanic attack against God's people. We find that Rome is sitting by the many waters. The prostitute is by the many waters. We'll see later on in this passage that she sits on the seven hills. Of course, Rome was known as the city of seven hills. And so we know this, again, is an example of any evil empire that is against God's people. The people on the earth are intoxicated with her adulteries. And we need to understand, guys, that sin is intoxicating. Yeah. You've been around drunk people before. Right. They don't think straight. Come on now. They can't drive. Right. They can't think. When we sin, we don't think straight spiritually. Yeah. We need to understand when we sin a little bit, we want more and we want more. And it's hard to restrain ourselves to the point where we get intoxicated and we're not even thinking the right way. And it causes delusion. Sin is an escape from reality. What is sin? If you're busy with us, sin is missing the mark. It's not obeying God's will. And a lot of times these things, they look so pleasing. Notice that the woman looks like royalty, doesn't she? She's adorned with precious stones and jewelry, uh, according to the Bible here. What God's trying to point out is this, is that sin looks alluring and pulls you in. So Rome or America or the world can be a seducing force but ultimately, it will destroy you on the inside. Come on out. John sees her for what she is and is greatly astonished. Are you astonished when you look at the world and the way it is, or are you kind of numb to it? You see, when we're numb to where the world is, we don't really share our faith that much because we don't really see that much of a difference. Mm. When we're numb, it's because we've been intoxicated. We've fallen into the American dream. Right, right. And God is calling us out. Right. The world's seducing and we see the gold and we get enormored by the seduction. The seduction of wealth. The greed. We want all the new things, all the new gadgets, and it sucks us in. Yeah. The seduction of lust. We think if I can just go outside of God's plan and have sex before marriage, that will fulfill a need and it seduces us in. But then we wake up and we're still empty and we're still looking. Right. Oh my. The seduction of emotional lust. Maybe you don't struggle with physical lust, but, but you get your comfort from a man or from a woman and it pulls you in and you think that's going to fulfill that need, but only God will. You're being seduced by Babylon, the satanic empire. Yeah. We get seduced into bitterness. We think hate's the solution. And this is what the prostitute did. They hated the Christians because the Christians revealed who they really were. The Christians exposed their sin and called them out on their lies. And they go, we got to kill them to the point they were drunk on the blood of the saints. Yeah. And some of us, we hate people. Yeah. And we get drunk on that hate. And we can't see we're intoxicated. Yeah. And we don't even understand. You know, are you bitter towards anybody in God's church today? Oh, yeah. Unresolved conflict. Don't fall into the seducing lie that bitterness is going to fix things and somehow cause justice against them. God will always avenge. Right. And that's the story of Revelation is that Rome would fall one day. It wouldn't be till 400 something um, AD that Rome would fall. And the Christians had to trust in God's sovereignty. But they didn't allow themselves to get bitter. Right. Because bitterness is that poison we drink thinking it's going to kill someone else. Yeah. You know, is there any relationship that you've been seduced into bitterness this morning? In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 7. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast you, which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go into its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. Well, that's interesting. That shows us that it doesn't only have to apply to Rome. It can apply to any empire that's not of God. Are you with me right here? Right. Once was, is, and will be in the future. These things will go on for all time. Verse 9, it says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the women sit. So that's how we know this is all talking about Rome, the seven hills. Verse 10, they are also the seven kings. Five have fallen, and one is. The other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. 
The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. So you say, what's this all about? What is all this, the seven heads and the ten horns and all this? Well, we got to remember a couple things about Revelation. Sometimes Revelation, we're in heaven. Sometimes we're on earth. Sometimes we're before judgment. Sometimes we're after judgment. Have you guys noticed that as we've gone through this? Yep. Yeah. Basically, chronology was not the point of Revelation. And if you know, in the Old Testament, even Jews, sometimes they weren't so concerned about chronolog chronological order as we are. And so understand, that's, that's not the message. The point of this book is not to figure out some kind of time sequence. So what are the seven heads and the ten horns? Well, he says the seven are the seven kings. Now we know if from our history classes, maybe in 11th grade or something, the first Caesars of Rome. Number one was Augustus. Number two was Tiberius, because that was the time that, that you know, Jesus was born and all that. Right. Then we got number three, Caligula. Then we have Claudius, number four. And then we have Nero, number five. Well, he says five have fallen, and one's yet to come. After Nero came Vespian, and then after Vespian, he had his son, Titus, and uh, Titus was significant um, because Titus was the one who ransacked Jerusalem that, that Jesus talked about. And then he says, there's going to come another, and we, eight is always a number of resurrection in the Bible. And so it's very interesting. The first five have fallen, ending with Nero who died. And we talked about back, I believe, in, in a couple chapters back in Revelation. Remember the horn that was wounded? And remember the myth that the Christians had that Nero would die and in some ways be resurrected and there'd be a greater persecution? Well, now we know when it talks about in this book, uh, in verse 12, the ten horns you saw are the ten kings. I'm sorry, in verse 11, it says the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. This is talking about Domitian. And now the intense persecution would come on the Christians. Pretty awesome how specific the Bible is. Come on now. Well, let's look in verse 12. It says, The ten horns you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. And the church says, Amen. so the kings that will line up for battle, of course, are these kings. All the symbolic kings of all time will line up for battle against God, but the lamb will be there and will triumph with all of us, all his chosen followers. We're going to have victory. Amen, guys. Amen. You know, the kings will line up and we need to understand that we are in a battle to win this city. We're in a battle to win this city. Recently, um, I saw Barna did a recent survey for 2017 of the top post-Christian cities. Yeah. Post-Christian meaning against God, doesn't want anything to do with it. And Boston ranked number two on the list. Wow. Wow. Number one was Portland, Maine. And in fact, the first 15 were all in New England. Wow. So God's chosen, his call, chosen, faithful, all of us to make an impact. I dream of changing that survey. Come on, my head. What if Barna had to change their survey? You say, well, how did they survey this? Well, they surveyed thousands of people. And to qualify as post-Christians, individuals had to meet nine or more of these following factors. Number one, they do not believe in God. Two, they identify as atheists or agnostic. Three, they disagree that faith is important in their lives. Four, they have not prayed to God in the last week. Five, have never made a commitment to Jesus. Six, disagree that the Bible's accurate. Seven, have not donated money to a church in the last year. Eight, have not attended a Christian church in the last six months. Nine, agree that Jesus committed sins. Ten, do not feel a responsibility to share their faith. Eleven, have not read their Bible in the last week. Twelve, have not volunteered at a church in the last week. 13, have not attended Sunday school in the last week. 14, have not attended religious small group in the last week. And 15, Bible engagement scale is low, meaning they don't, have not read the Bible in the past week or disagree strongly somewhat that the Bible is not accurate. And finally, they're not born again. That's where we live, the second most place in the nation. Wow. What are we going to do, guys? Change it. Reach the what are we going to do? Are we just going to let Armageddon happen and just all be defeated and kind of just be these mamsy pamsy Christians? Uh, you know, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, look what happens. 
It says, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitutes. Well, that's interesting. Now it's this internal conflict because beast is Rome, prostitutes Rome. Now it's hating each other. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over the beast, the royal authority, until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. What do we learn from this? Why is the prostitute and the beast destroying each other? Sin is self-destructive. And all historians will tell you that the vast amounts of unself-restraint is what led to Rome's downfall. Do whatever you please. Live however you want. Sin destroys our relationships. The Bible makes it clear Domitian, the eighth king, is going to be destroyed. Not only him, but by Rome itself. The beast and the ten horns will hate the prostitute. In the Bible, evil is always self-destructive. The very evil that Rome preached turned back to kill it. And we need to understand, sin is no game. It will turn back and it will devour you. Mm. It messes with your brain cells in some cases. It messes up our psyche. We do things we never could have imagined we've done. Maybe there's things you've never told anyone about that you've kept in your heart and you just go, how did I get to that place? How did I get there? It's a place where I would take advantage of somebody. How did I get to a place where I would have slept with these many people? What happened to the innocence and the fear of God that I used to have? It's the nature of sin itself destructive it messes us up yeah. you know our second point is the funeral for fallen Babylon now we come to chapter 18 and now we see the funeral that's put on for the city that fell the evil empire against God because of its destructive sin Look in verse 1 of chapter 18. It says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. I mean, that's got to be a bright angel right there. That's pretty awesome. Well, I mean, sometimes you put your angel on top of your Christmas tree and, you know, you got the light on and it kind of illuminates things. But imagine one that illuminates the whole earth. Wow. Pretty awesome picture John's giving us here. And it says in verse 2, With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the Great. She became a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people! so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. That's a lot of sin. <laughs> My own sin overwhelmed me when I studied the Bible to become a Christian. But imagine, he goes, the sin of Rome's piled up to heaven. And now God's going to do something about it. Now she's dead. It says in verse 6, Give back to her as she has been given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her death and mourning and famine. She'll be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Woo! Wow. Not your typical nice Sunday morning sermon this morning, huh? <laughs> This is intense. The funeral of fallen Babylon. What was the major sin that caused Rome to fall that the scriptures and the spirit want to warn us about today? Well, verse 3 is very significant. At this point, he says, sin, it makes the place you're at a haunt of demons. Hopefully that's not your household. Amen. Because the more we sin, we invite evil spirits. I don't understand how it all works, but just understand, the more we sin, we invite evil spirits into our territory that we live in. And he says, at this point, Rome's just a haunt of, of demons. And he says in verse 3 that they got drunk off the maddening wine of her adulteries, but notice what it says at the end. And the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. What was the big sin? They idolized comfort and luxury. They idolized comfort and wealth. People were intoxicated by it. Even in verse 7, it's interesting. He says, I'm going to give you as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. 
She just filled herself with it. People just go, I want to be rich. I want to be comfortable. That's what I want out of this life. As much gold, as much comfort as I can receive, as much luxury as I can get. Oh, and is that not the American message today? Come on out. Let me feed myself. Let me get everything I can to find as much pleasure as I can out of this life. What's the call for God's people in this passage? He says in verse 4, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins. That's what the Spirit's saying to us this morning, guys. Come out from this world. Come out from the message of this world and don't share in her sins. Her sins had piled up to heaven. We don't want to receive any of these plagues. We live, as I said, in the American empire where self and king and luxury and comfort are the goals and God says he's going to bring the plagues. And Next, what's interesting in verse 9, there's a threefold woe. And remember, woe means there's an impending judgment coming. And in verse 9, the woe goes to the kings of the earth who committed adultery, and it says shared in her luxury. Amen? Well, then we see as well in verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep, and they'll mourn because no one buys their cargo anymore. Now here's a picture of the kings and the merchants weeping because now they don't have any more money. Now it's falling. The economy's falling and they can't sell anything anymore. They're empty and they're crying over their loss. In verse 17, it says, in one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. And they just look at the burning of the city as the smoke rises. So we see the kings, we see the merchants and the sailors are all left empty and weeping because they chased after wealth and luxury. Why do we as people put our security and trust in that which can be taken away? Why do we put our security and trust in that which can be taken away? How do we know if we put our security and trust in something? Well, you weep when it's taken away. You weep when it's taken away. You, I love uh, Raphael and Melissa, our South House Church leaders. Yeah! And they sacrificed so much. Literally, they, gave, they had a savings account. They gave everything up so they could move to the South and preach the gospel. And we had a phenomenal house church last Sunday with Raphael preaching. Amen. Amen. Well, I love Raphael one day is driving in their car and they just spent like a couple thousand to get it fixed. And, uh, or, I'm sorry, no, this is before they got fixed. Um, and, but it broke down again. Anyway, that's all another story. They're, they're driving in their car and this tunnel and all of a sudden their car's transmission goes out and it's in one of the tunnels. Oh. And it broke down. You know Melissa's response? I won't tell you about Raphael's sin and how much he was stressed out. And anxious, <laughs> Melissa just starts laughing. <laughs> and I love it, Melissa's spirit because she understands these are just things. Yeah. Come on, Melissa. She's not seduced by the Babylonian prostitutes. She understands they're just things. It's just stuff. You can't take it to heaven with you. So we bought into this lie that we have to like be rich. It's not a sin to be rich if God blesses you, but you understand that money's now to use to be build his kingdom. Are you with me right here? We need to understand, guys, that do we have Melissa's spirit where we just laugh? Or are we like this merchant weeping? What about if our significant other leaves us in divorce because they fall away from Christ? What about if our girlfriend or our boyfriend dumps us? Do you weep? Well, yeah, you're going to be hurt. It's okay to hurt. But do you weep like this, where you were seduced by Babylon the prostitute and it's all you had because you were just filled on a person? Come on, Mike. If you live like that, don't fall away. Yeah. And you won't be watching. I mean, you'll, you'll just watch the smoke arise, as it says, of all your dreams fade away because your hope was not in our God who never lets us down. Wow. Come on, Mike. People will hurt you. Even in the church, we will hurt each other. We will sin against each other. I will make decisions that maybe you don't agree with from time to time. It may hurt you. We gotta talk and deal with it as family. But we cannot put our security and our trust in people. Are you with me right here, guys? And I love Melissa's spirit because she loves the Lord. This is written to God's people. Why? Because they were too, uh, tempted to be seduced by Rome. I don't know how many thousands probably denied Jesus in order to participate in the Roman economy. I don't know how many gave it up and said, this is too much. But he's writing, come out, don't give up. Many of us brothers have been, and sisters have been seduced into wealth. Now, you wouldn't think so. It's kind of tricky because you go, well, no, Mike, you don't understand. I live in a household with seven other people. I haven't been seduced by wealth. Well, it's interesting. I want you to think about for a moment. 
What would you say to a son who has a bunch of money and his mom is poor, and kicked out on the street, and the son does nothing to help his mother? What sin would you call that that the son's struggling with? Greed, selfishness. You know, this past Sunday, we had 35 people give zero to God in our weekly contribution out of a church of around 96. They're preaching the gospel, working for God that we've got to support. 13%, I believe is the number of our money, goes to support our mission work every week that we do around the world. Amen. So it's not just about Gianni and, and Peter and Jess and myself and Chanel. Uh, this is about a worldwide thing that we give to from a practical standpoint. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. And let's look in Malachi chapter 3. With you, bro. And let's make sure we haven't been seduced by the prostitutes. Right. You say, Mike, why do we keep talking about this? Well, as a man of God, I am called by God to keep preaching to the sin in the church until it changes. And so we will talk about it every week until it's repented of. Amen. I have to stand before God on how I led the people. Yep. Amen. I have to stand before God on how I led the people. You know, we read in Malachi chapter 3, an Old Testament principle in verse 6, the people had just rebuilt God's temple. They were fired up. Now they could worship God again. These were the exiles that came out of slavery. They rebuilt the temple. And in a lot of ways, guys, last year, since last year, in June, God's blessed us. We've rebuilt God's temple here in Boston. Yeah. I mean, it's been incredible. Yeah. But now that the temple was rebuilt, God goes, I'm still having a challenge with you. <laughs> a lot of you guys are giving your defiled animals, and many of you are not giving your tithes and offerings. So we can't stop at just building the temple, we got to sustain the work of the temple. Amen. He says in verse 6, I the Lord do not change. So is God different in the Old Testament than he was in the New Testament? No. No, it's the same, right? Some people think God became a Christian in the New Testament. It's now just really nice. He doesn't care what you do. No, God's always been a Christian. And God still cares what you do. Amen? Amen. It says, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But yes, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. God wanted Israel to be blessed and for the other nations to come and go, we can worship God here, and to see the plentiful crops, and just to be a prosperous place to worship God. God wants that for spiritual Israel, his church. Amen. Amen. And he goes, guys, stop robbing me. They go, well, how are we robbing you? He goes, you're not giving your tithe. Tithe what meant 10% of what you make. And it was supposed to be the first fruits of what you receive. Amen. And God goes, if you would give your tithe, I would pour out the floodgates on the church. And think about how much God's already blessed us, guys. Imagine if we repented collectively in this, what he would do. <laughs> I'm like excited to see that. Amen. To me, it's an incredible opportunity. The church is not falling apart. Joe's been very wise on how we've planned the finances. That's not the issue. It's a spiritual issue. Yeah. It's about your relationship with God. And that's why God goes, return to me. I want you to be close to me, but I want to know you love me because where your treasure is, there your heart is. Right. And he says, I will bless you. You know, I'm so inspired by two of the sisters. You know, Tamika was sharing, and today's Tamika's birthday here, amen. Yeah. And I love the hair. She just looks like Storm from X-Men or something. You know? That's pretty awesome. But, you know, Tamika uh, was, was faced with a challenge with some, uh, I believe it was some help she was trying to help her family with, and different issues that, that she had to sacrifice. And, and she wasn't going to be able to pay her rent. And she goes, you know something? God's always come through with me when I've given my tithe to him and stayed committed come to on. him. Oh, man. She goes, I'm going to give my tithe. She goes and checks her mail and has a 700 something dollar check in the mail. Wow. And then had another $100 check in the mail. Wow. And she was able to not only pay her rent, but able to be able to help her family out when she goes to Atlanta this week. Is that pretty yeah. awesome? 
I love Friday Night at Devo, you know, Sharon Green raised her hand and, and, and uh, shared for good news and she goes, I almost, I wasn't going to be able to pay my rent. And it came between my rent and my commitment to God. And she goes, you know something? I just went on faith and gave to God and all of a sudden, God gave me extra money. Wow. That's the God we serve. Yeah. Awesome. We need to imitate these sisters' faith. Some of us have not given because we go, I've got to take care of my family needs, or I've got to take care of my bills, or I've got to take care. And God comes first above all of those things. Oh, yeah. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. A little survey of Corinthians will show in the New Testament God's heart for giving. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. You guys still with me here? 1 yeah. Corinthians 9. You were all worried when I told you how many chapters we had to get through. Yeah. And we've already blasted through most of it. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 14, Paul's making an argument on basically how he worked while he served the church. And uh, that's a pretty incredible task. And I really want to lift up those who volunteer their service as house church leaders and Bible talk leaders without getting a paid a dime for the church. church leaders that they, they spend a lot of time. I mean, they could get paid for a lot of the work they do. You need to understand that. Um, but they choose to volunteer and do it. But then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14. He says, in the same way, the Lord, and he talks about the Old Testament, verse 13, how the priests got paid by the temple work they did. And verse 14 says, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Amen, guys? Amen. And so the Bible commands that those who preach God's word should make their living off God's words. This comes from the gifts and the offerings that we give every Sunday morning. So I'm just doing some teaching on this because I don't know if everyone understands what the money gets used to. And we're a very transparent financially church. You can talk to Joe. He will show you what every dime goes to. I believe we spend a couple thousand on the building in, in a month. We spend a, a, a couple thousand on the salaries. Um, but this is to propel God's works. And our goal is not to invest in a building. Most churches invest in buildings and programs. That is wrong. The Bible, they didn't even have buildings. Not wrong to have a church building, but I'm just saying that's wrong to invest all that. We invest all of our money into mission work and putting new preachers on staff. Is that pretty awesome? That's what we do. And I don't know about you, I was really sad when the last five weeks that we've lost thousands of dollars because people have not been giving because Peter and Jess's wedding was so beautiful. And when they came back, they were so fired up for their honeymoon and my heart was heavy because they're coming back to a situation where we actually had to talk about at staff possibly taking someone off staff. I talked about it, I said maybe my wife goes back to work for a little bit. Look at how much the women's ministries grow. Can you imagine not having that? And before we ever do anything like that, we will start meeting in a park every Sunday, okay? Because I'm committed to these guys. But from a family, secular perspective, are we even committed to our family? The Bible commands that we support them. Secondly, look in 1 Corinthians 16. With you, bro. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week. Now what day is that? Sunday. Sunday, that's today, amen. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made, amen? amen. Paul took this collection for the church in Jerusalem and some of the challenges they had with the poor, and he goes, this collection should be set aside at the beginning of every Sunday. That shows me there's preparation that should go into Sunday when we come with our sacrifice. Amen. Now, no one tells anybody what to give. We all made a decision when we got baptized how much we're going to give to God. Amen? And so now we've got to show faithfulness and integrity in what we give. And the Bible says, set aside a sum of money, keeping with your income. You've got to be responsible. Amen, guys? We've got to take care of our bills. We've got to be responsible. But God always comes first, and he will help you. Do you get advice from those in your life, your house church leaders? If you're not able to pay your bills, get input from those in the church who can. Talk to Sal. Talk to Joe Mack. Talk to people that have proven to have their lives together financially and get the help that's needed. Amen? Amen. And Paul goes, you got to do this because when I come, I don't want to have to come find you so that I can make sure you're good on what you pledge to give. That's accountability. Amen? 
And most churches do this. We write on our envelope uh, our name and we give our tithe and our, our gift to God. Amen. So understand, tithing is an Old Testament command. In the New Testament, God says he wants us to decide to just give something that comes from our heart. A sacrifice out of what God has given to us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Come on, bro. And 1 Corinthians 5 is a challenging passage because the Corinth church started to be seduced by Babylon. And there was sexual immorality, and they had to bring a brother uh, out, they had to kick a brother out of the church who was dangerous to the church in Corinth because he was sleeping in the sin of fornication. And, you know, for us as a congregation, we believe in preaching the scriptures. Amen? Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul writes, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Wow. What business is in mind to judge those outside the church? Because wow. guys, you don't need to judge those outside the church. They're already lost. Wow. He goes, are you not to judge those inside? Woo! You go, I thought Jesus said, do not judge. Yeah. Well, that's one of the most misinterpreted passages in that. Right. He says, don't judge hypocritically. He says, move the plank from your own eye, then you can make a correct judgment. Right. So he goes, don't be sleeping around and telling people you shouldn't be sleeping around. Right. That's what Jesus was talking about. Here he goes, absolutely we make judgments in the church. Yeah. And then he says in verse 13, God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Well, how's this work? Well, we find a couple sins that people can be kicked out of the church for. In verse 10, we find immorality, we find greed, we find swindlers and idolaters. We can be disfellowshipped for having a greedy heart. And who would it be the most sinful to be greedy towards? God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. With you, bro. Matthew chapter 18. One of the things I loved when I visited the church was that this was a church that actually practiced the Bible. Amen. Because God wants to protect his church. Right. Maybe you're visiting, you're a little uncomfortable. You go, this is a pretty hard lesson here. This is a pretty serious church. Yes, we are serious about following Jesus. Amen. And in Matthew 18, Jesus has a way to deal with sin. Now, we all sin. Everyone sins in here, right? Yep. I sin. I had sin yesterday. We all sin. We all need his forgiveness. So this is not talking about just kicking someone out that sins. <laughs> this is a, talking about someone who persists to be rebellious and yeah. decides I'm not going to change in heart and action. Yeah. And so in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, he says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Woo! So we have four steps here. Number one, if I see my brother Peter here is in sin, I gotta go up to Peter and I say, hey bro, can we talk? And I go, you know, this isn't right. Uh, you know, I, I, you haven't given your contribution to God or whatever it is. Maybe I, you've been in a, some type of sin. Peter, if he has a godly heart, will look at the scriptures and will go, wow, you're right. I'm so good. I repent. And amen. It's done. Amen. amen. And then God forgives him. Now, maybe I'm lack discernment and I, he doesn't believe he's in sin. That happens a lot of times because people have different perspectives. So step two then is to get someone more spiritually mature. So then maybe me and Peter go, well, bro, we're gonna have to pull salad to this one. And so we get salad and he comes in and sits down and he talks. And he goes, yeah, Peter, actually you are in sin, bro. This is wrong. Peter goes, and I see, I change. That's the second step. Or maybe I'm wrong. He goes, Mike, actually you're really calling him out on something that's not even a real or biblical thing. Um, you gotta, then I, I, I And then we're done. Amen? Yeah. Most every case always gets done like that. And very rarely I ever seen have to go to the next step. Although we've seen a few times, even in our congregation, that sometimes it has to go to step three. Because if they persist in their sin, what step three is, we saw this this past Wednesday with one of our brothers, right? What step three is, is that someone is brought before the congregation, and their sin is told to the congregation, but it's not a witch hunt where you're out to stone someone. And so that, hey, guys, we need to be praying for Peter. Because he's been in the sin of greed, and we need to come together and really love him. 
And it's a powerful time in the church. Believe it or not, I was actually brought on step three of church discipline years ago when I was young. And I'm here. So that's God's plan. We need to get behind. This is how Jesus says to deal with sin. And sadly, the church has gotten so cowardly and so scared that they don't obey Jesus in many places anymore. Now, the fourth step is if they still persist even after being brought before the church, then they're asked to leave the congregation. You go, bro, it'd probably be best that you leave. There's still contact between you and the minister in case they decide they want to repent and they can always come back and change, amen? But this is a time of discipline that 1 Corinthians 5 says that maybe they'll learn from the world and be grateful for God's kingdom. One of the things that we've decided to do in the congregation is we've had uh, multiple people that have just been persistent in their sin and their rebellion and not giving their contribution. Like they've literally just been like defiant about it. Um, we're going to start having church discipline talks with them because the Bible commands us as disciples to deal with the greed that's in their hearts. And so we're going to have a step one talk and a step two talk. Now, again, we're here to help. There are some people in our church we have to give benevolence to because they just can't afford anything. That, that, those are the situations I'm not talking about. That, that, we're talking about people that have it and refuse to give zero. I appreciate one brother. I won't say his name. He's been going through a horrific time financially. And I get emotional just thinking about it. He, he, he put 95 cents in the plate. Because he goes, I'm not appearing before God empty-handed. And yet many of us appear empty-handed and show contempt towards God because we are with Babylon the prostitutes. So today, what have we decided as a staff to do to help correct the problem? On July 30th, we're going to have a two times, a double contribution to make up for what we've done. Come on out. Because we got to catch up so that we can, according to God's plan, live within our means. Right. Live within our means. We always simply base our budget off what every member decides to give. I want to encourage us. This is a spiritual issue. In Matthew 18 and verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus. So this is after hearing all about church discipline and everything. So then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Some, translate, some manuscripts say 77 times seven. He basically says an unlimited amount of times. Peter wanted to hold a grudge and goes, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, boom, I'm done forgiving you. And Jesus goes, no. And then Jesus tells a parable of an unmerciful servant. The servant is forgiven an unpayable debt that he can never pay back. And then when someone under him owes him five bucks, he goes, dude, I am sending you to the jailers. I'm sending you until you pay me back. You need to pay me back. He rings his then pay me back my five dollars. Even though he was forgiving a debt that he could never pay back. And God goes, that guy's going to be thrown to the torturers. If you do not forgive men or women here on earth, you will not be forgiven in heaven. Right. And so we need to decide, who do we need to forgive and let go of? Guys, God's given us so much. Come on, Mike. He's given us our salvation. Yeah. He's given us a family. Look around at the diversity and the different types of people he's brought together. We are family, amen? amen. God's given us all this, so can we give back to God? Yes. I love John 10.10. 10. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and give it abundantly, amen? amen? The abundant life, the full life. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. What's the abundant life? I really believe. You know what's amazing? The people that have extra money and the people that are fruitful and the people that are able to give and take care of others are those who have given to God first because God meets their needs. Right. Come on. In Luke 16, 9, the Bible simply says this. I tell you, use your worldly wealth. I like how he calls it worldly wealth. Amen. Worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So what are we supposed to use our money for, guys? Gain friends. To gain friends, to save souls. If you're not giving your contribution, I know you're probably not out there buying meals for people who are lost. We're supposed to have money so that we can spend it to help win souls for Christ and his kingdom and gain friends, amen? amen. Well, let us not be discouraged by the funeral of Babylon. Let us be triumphant in rejoicing that God's going to bring down this evil world empire. Amen. The victorious saints were called out of their luxury of this world to be disciples of Christ. As we close out, let's close out in Revelation 19. 
our third and final point, Jesus wins the war. Amen. Amen. Christ will be triumphant. And he will win. The question is, will we be on the winning side? In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9, the Bible says, Then the angel said, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. You know, right before this, they triumphed at the fall of Babylon, and they sang where we get the Hallelujah Chorus song. Amen? Amen? And then it says that they're invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And those invited to God's kingdom are blessed. And John falls at his feet to the angel. And the angel goes, no, dude, just get up. I'm just a servant like anybody else. You know, sometimes we get so amazed that we start worshiping the miracles of God. We see the baptisms, we see the fire, and we're excited to see all the new people coming to God's kingdom, and we're falling down to that. And when those miracles slow down, and we don't see as much going on in our lives, what happens? Our faith wanes. Because we put our faith and hope in the miracles rather than the Creator, amen? amen? Let us not bow down to the wrong thing, but worship our God. The disciples who are those, those who hold to the testimony of Jesus, are you sharing your faith? Are you out there preaching the gospel to non-Christians? In chapter 19, verse 11, we see the end here. This is a beautiful picture. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on the white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Of course, we learned earlier in verse 8 that those are the righteous acts of God's people, the fine linen. Righteousness. Verse 15, it says, Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So if you wondered if tattoos are wrong, there you go. Jesus has a tattoo. Amen. And revelation. Yeah. There you go. Verse 17, I'm kidding. <laughs> and I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Now, now put your seatbelts on. This gets a little graphic right here. Come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, oh. generals, and the mighty, and of horses and these riders, and all the flesh of all the people flee and slave, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. Not much of a war, huh? The beast was captured and with it the false prophet and who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Little violence and yet the victory is our heavenly warrior Jesus's. Amen. And we are with him and this is a picture of triumph over evil. And the Bible says that the birds of the air gorge the flesh of those who rebelled against God. Look in Luke 17. With you, bro. In Luke 17 and verse 30. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with the possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and another left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. He goes, remember Lot's wife? Guys, what happened to Lot's wife when she turned back? She became a pillar of salt. And so guys, when we look back to our old life, we get paralyzed spiritually. Yep. You ever just felt stuck? I can't move forward. It's because we're looking back to something in the world. It's time to march forward as a church. Amen. What if you put your past behind you? 
And he said, you know something? God's forgiven me if I'm in the light. It's time to follow the heavenly warrior, Jesus Christ. We live in a fallen world, and this book certainly has application to us today. We are his chosen in a world that drifts further and further away from God and the stubbornness of their sin. To end, I want to give our church simply two charges that I want us to all go after this week, practice. Amen. Simply two charges. Number one, the first charge we have as a congregation, there's a need for new leadership in our congregation. There's a need for people to raise up and become Bible talk leaders, for people to raise up and to become preachers of the gospel. Will you step up? Let's look at Ezekiel 22. Come on now. I'm so proud of one brother, our brother Kyle, amen? Come on, Kyle. Yeah. And Kyle was awesome. He just goes, you know something? He saw a need in the church. He said, you know, we need to have a single parents ministry in the church. And he took the charge and started a single parents Bible talk. And today, Kyle's going to be sharing his life story with us for communion. Is that pretty awesome, guys? But you know, what ministry has God put on your heart? You don't have to wait around for some. Maybe you have a huge heart for the poor. What if you started a ministry where you grabbed some disciples together and you went out and fed people on Saturday mornings? What if you have a huge heart? What's God moving that you say, I need to be a part of, I need to do? In Ezekiel 22, we saw all the destruction of this world in Revelation. In Ezekiel 22, in verse 30, God's talking about the judgment coming on his people. And in verse 30, he says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So I'll pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery angle, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. The Bible says God's looking, he's scanning around for someone who's going to stand in the gap. Amen. Who's going to say, I'll step up. Here am I, send me. If you're visiting with us today, I want to challenge you to join the revolutionary movement of God. stand in the gap to preach the gospel. Oh, my. One of the things we're doing is, of course, we have our staff group with our incredible house church leaders and our shepherds in training in the congregation. But what we've realized is we need another level of leadership to raise on up. And so what we're going to start this Saturday morning is what we are calling the lion's den. Amen. Amen. And you remember how Daniel's faith withstood the lion's den? And of course, Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah because he's the true lion that's going to defeat that false lion, Satan. And so what we're going to do on Saturday morning is we, Chanel and I have selected a bunch of people we believe could really lead in God's kingdom. And you'll find out this week who you are. And what we're going to do, we're going to meet on Saturday morning outside, probably somewhere in a park. We're going to split up men and women. We'll do some physical activity together because God wants us to be healthy. Amen. Amen. And then we're going to have a time of spiritual training, of spiritual boot camps, mock Bible talks, mock preaching. And it's going to be a glorious time where we disciple one another and help sharpen another in Christ, one another in Christ. Oh, Amen, guys. Amen. And so be praying. You know, if you're not part of the lion's den, God is sovereign and it's just not his timing yet. Amen. But we really believe every single person is called to lead. Number two, our second and last charge. We need every member of the church to radically recommit themselves back to the purpose which Jesus called them to. Amen. I think what's happened as the church has grown is you have a lot of the leadership bringing new Christians and, I'm sorry, new members to the church and visitors. But the Bible calls all of us to be totally committed to Christ. We shared on Friday night at our campus devotional two scriptures. Look in Mark chapter 1. Come on, bro. In verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus calls his first followers and he says, come follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Meaning this, that God, when we follow him, when we're truly walking with him, we will become people who fish. Now, what if the fisherman told you he was a fisherman, but he never caught any fish? Not a good fisherman, amen? Yet, as disciples, have you caught any fish, any people for the gospel? 
I really believe with all my heart, this week, we need to challenge ourselves to recommit ourselves to our purpose. All right. I believe every Christian can have a visitor out at Bible Talk, amen? Yep. I believe every Christian can have a visitor out for church and someone they're working with. If we're not fishing for men, if we're not a disciple maker, we're not living as a disciple. And we need to really call ourselves back to this purpose and get excited about it. You've been given salvation. It's worth more than gold, worth more than a million dollars. You found it, guys, and you get a chance to deliver it. We won't get to do that in heaven. This is a blessing we get to experience on earth. Amen. And so are we sharing our faith now and taking advantage of it? And think of all the new friends. And some of our people that we know now are, that are our best friends are people we shared our faith with. Yeah. How many more people need to hear this message? We talked about with the staff that the church really needs, we need to start teaching the church to rely more on the power of the Holy Spirit. In the early church, it was the Holy Spirit that did the evangelism. In the early church, it was the Holy Spirit that gave us the words to say. And here in Luke chapter 12, we find in verse 8, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you'll defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Is that fire on up in the Lord right there? Yeah. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say. So many times we're like, I've just got to say the right thing. Or I've got to say it really cool so that they'll want to listen to me. And I've never seen a cool way to talk about Jesus. You know what I mean? What are you going to say? Hey, what's up, man? You heard about the Lord Jesus? My Bible says we're not to actually think about what we're about to say. Wow. The Holy Spirit... I discovered in the scriptures works in our evangelism only when we put ourselves at risk. Why are we not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit the way it could be? It's because we're too comfortable. We've been seduced by the luxury of Babylon. But when we decide to step out and share our faith with people that intimidate us, and we decide to just go in there, I don't know what I'm going to say. I was at Starbucks the other day and there's a, a guy that intimidated me sitting, sitting down and I just go, all right, let's just go for it. The guy said he was looking for something new, you know, new to do and, and gave me his card and it was awesome. Why just had to step out on faith and go, let's just go for it. You see, if the Holy Spirit, you're not feeling his presence and power in your life, you're not taking enough risks. And you gotta be vulnerable to put yourself out there because Jesus won. He won the victory, amen? So number one, guys, today as we think and consider Revelation, we're almost done. Next week, we're going to close out talking about heaven, amen? But number one, don't be seduced by the prostitutes. Number two, remember the funeral that's going to happen of any empire that's against God. And number three, Jesus is the heavenly warrior who wins the victory. Let's stand in the gap and make the needs for leadership in the congregation. And let's all be called back to our purpose to evangelize the nations in our generation. Thank you, God. Amen.